Hi, Mark. Hello. How are you doing? Very good. Very good. Just wanted to do a mic check. So okay. you sound great. You sound good. Thank you. Right. Yeah, I had trouble finding the right email. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still waiting for Nancy. No, oh, Nancy's here. Oh, okay. Just didn't see her. I, I stopped my video, Mark. Hi. Hi. So, so you, you all can see the, uh, the Zephyr slide I'm showing? Yep. Oh, okay. Okay, we have crossed uh, the magical uh, 50 participant mark. And so I think that's a good point to, uh, to get started. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, this event, uh, which is a panel uh, with presentations uh, on behavior dynamics, the future accelerated. Uh, so we added the word accelerated because of all that we have experienced uh, in the past several months. My name is Ram Pindiala. I'm a professor at Arizona State University in the School of Sustainable Engineering in the Built Environment. Um, and I'll just serve as a moderator for this uh, distinguished panel of speakers and, and discussant as well. So we will get right into it because I'm sure you're here to listen to the presenters rather than me uh, try to uh, uh, give uh, elaborate introductions. However, I, I've just, uh, displayed a slide um, essentially showing the agenda. So we have a keynote by Steve Polzine, followed by our major presentations by Gabe Yu, Mark Bradley, and Nancy McGuckin. Uh, Cynthia Chen will serve as discussant, and Elizabeth Saul is our tireless volunteer who actually is making all of this possible. So this event is brought to you by Zephyr Foundation, an organization, a nonprofit that's really dedicated to advancing uh, the state of the practice and the state of the art of travel demand modeling and forecasting. Um, and also brought to you by the TomNet University Transportation Center. So I do want to acknowledge the University Transportation Support a transportation center support to Arizona State University and its consortium members of Georgia Tech, University of Washington, and University of South Florida that uh, makes all of this possible. Uh, please uh, just follow the code of conduct, uh, be nice uh, and be um, uh, professional and all will be well. Otherwise, uh, we will use the power of the mute button <laughs> or even uh, or even exit you from this. Uh, the discussion, uh, please use the chat box to post questions and comments, and we will do our best to address, uh, to address them uh, towards the end when we have some open time for discussion. We will also potentially have you unmute yourself and be able to engage in dialogue. If you need help, use the chat or email the admin. And we are recording this event so uh, that uh, so just uh, keep that in mind uh, when you are uh, speaking and so on that anything you say will be in perpetuity uh, recorded and posted. So with that, we will uh, get started. I'm going to stop sharing. And Steve Polzine is our starting speaker and he's going to talk about the residual impacts of COVID on travel and transportation planning. Steve was with uh, the University of South Florida for, for many years and is now a senior advisor for research and technology with the US Department of Transportation. Steve. Okay, Ram, everybody see the uh, slide here? 
Yes, yes, we can see your okay. slide. Yep, you're perfect. Great, it's a pleasure to be with folks today. Um, a fascinating time to be in our profession. Uh, the world is changing. I think the title uh, referencing the acceleration of change is certainly uh, appropriate. Um, I'm going to take uh, uh, 25 minutes of very fast talking uh, to go through a number of pieces of information that uh, myself and some folks at uh, USDOT have assembled uh, to try and get our hands uh, around this issue of what's going to happen uh, post-COVID and particularly uh, what are the implications um, for today's discussion. I'm going to try and focus that on planning kinds of issues, um, issues that uh, uh, this audience hopefully uh, is going to be very, very sensitive to. And with that, I'll, I'll move directly to the content. Obviously, the context is, is important. Um, it's fairly compellingly clear right now that um, the significance of COVID is indeed dramatic. Its duration and the depth and the magnitude of impact uh, it's had on transportation are certainly unprecedented within our lifetimes. Um, and there's compelling evidence accumulating that the residual impacts, uh, the post-COVID uh, world will in fact be different. Um, and while we're still speculating on uh, just how different it'll be um, and what are the attributing causes, et cetera. Um, and there's some sense that it'll change uh, differentially by mode and perhaps by geography. Uh, and the pace of uh, reaching a new normal may in fact uh, differ across the modes. Um, and, and in the light of those changes, a lot of what we do as transportation professionals uh, needs to be revisited and rethought um, in the context of perhaps a real different world. We have some neat opportunities to do that right now. Uh, we're approaching reauthorization. There's lots of talk of infrastructure initiatives. Uh, there's a new, infra or a new administration um, that will be in place soon. Um, and that really creates an opportunity and in fact a need to review um, how we do transportation. Um, and in my opinion, that would cover the full range of elements from uh, planning, funding, spending, regulation, uh, rethinking the roles of government uh, at different levels and perhaps rethinking the role of the public and private sector. So really everything is on the table as we move ahead uh, and frankly should be because of the uh, magnitude of the changes we're seeing. This is a slide of what I'm not going to talk about, um, but just to make it clear that the, the COVID situation has impacted all means of transportation. Freight's been less impacted, uh, as you can see from this trend graph, um, but nonetheless, uh, it did in fact uh, impact it. Um, and there's certainly lessons to be learned within the freight community as well, um, but that's uh, for another day. Um, this is really a key picture. This is a, a kind of a monthly trend of what was going on on all of the surface uh, and air passenger travel modes. Um, and there's a couple of kind of distinct characteristics of this graph. Uh, the blue upper line is vehicle miles of travel, um, obviously dramatically less impacted than the other lines on the graph. Um, obviously, the ability to distance yourself and or assure your uh, lack of transmission or, or receipt of, of a disease from uh, fellow passengers, if any, is within your control. Um, so uh, while personal travel was impacted by closings and other factors, um, there wasn't the, the fear of uh, contagion uh, and proximity during the Travel Act itself, um, and hence it was much less significantly impacted. The other four lines here uh, represent group modes of travel, uh, modes where folks uh, are, are, are concerned about distancing and transmission of disease. Um, and, and they're also unique in that these modes are influenced not only by your willingness to use them, but by the operators or providers' willingness to provide the same levels of service uh, that existed previously. Um, so there's both supply and demand factors at play uh, for these modes, uh, and obviously distinctly different impact uh, as you look at those trends. 
to give context, particularly when I talk to policy folks that maybe don't have the same grounding in transportation, uh, I use this graph to give a little bit of perspective. Um, household vehicle travel is the big dog in terms of person miles. About 70% of person mobility uh, is carried out uh, via vehicle travel when you measure it in person miles. Uh, next highest would be domestic air at approximately 13%. Uh, then commercial vehicles, that's uh, police, fire, mail delivery, all kinds of delivery services, chauffeured services, et cetera, um, at, at about 11% heavy vehicles, bus and, and commercial trucks at about 6%. Um, and then uh, rail transit, meaning Amtrak and public transit uh, are collectively about 1% of the person miles of travel. Um, so when you think about what we read and hear about transportation uh, and impacts, it's important to have um, some context like this uh, to, to, to learn from and uh, be cognizant of. Uh, this is a graph that I've had some fun with. I haven't played with this for about two hours. Um, so it's uh, something that I uh, update on occasion when new data comes out. Um, and there's really two purposes for this graph. This extends the uh, the first graph I shared earlier, which is on the left-hand side, um, and extrapolates the potential recovery scenarios uh, for the various modes. Um, and there's really two points that uh, I try and communicate with this. One is we're going to have a recovery period. Um, and that recovery period, uh, depending on who you ask, is likely to be a couple of years. Um, and there's decisions that we need to make um, and things we need to understand about that period. How much should we be spending, investing, what's the level of service, what's the passenger uh, demand response, et cetera, um, and how do we um, manage our transportation system uh, and investment and policies through that recovery period. Um, and finally, what is the new normal? Um, where are we at when we get through that period when our travel behavior stabilizes to at least some uh, trends that aren't influenced by COVID? Uh, there may be other factors at play, um, but where do we get back to? Um, and that's perhaps more fascinating when we think about long range planning. Um, in this particular scenario, there's a couple of unique characteristics. Uh, you'll notice the bubble on the red line um, that uh, approaches uh, back to zero uh, next year. And that's what I'm anticipating is something of a, a, of a rebound where people um, anxious to get, uh, get about and, and Carry, make, make some trips that had been postponed in the past, in the past um, and do an awful lot of roadway travel next summer and fall um, as the other modes are still recovering and perhaps as air hasn't fully recovered. Um, and then you see a stable period. And interestingly, um, this period is more modest than 2019. I think we'll look back at 2019 as something of a signature year uh, in terms of transportation and data. Um, that'll be the comparator that we'll look at uh, for a number of years, perhaps even decades going forward uh, to see how trends materialize. Um, this particular uh, set of numbers shows the percent changes for these modes according to the scenarios on the previous page. Uh, and I want to clarify, these are scenarios, while I think they're informed by some um, experience and knowledge, um, they're, they're best guesses and uh, they change fairly regularly as the duration of the pandemic and, and other observations of travel behavior um, come to the for there really isn't a powerful way to do these forecasts. We, they're simply unprecedented in terms of the magnitude of the change in the number of variables. Um, so to pretend that we can do a good job of forecasting uh, that recovery period, I think is, is suspect. Again, the top line is passenger VMT. Um, to give a little perspective, when we had the what was called now the Great Recession, um, VMT had peaked in 2007. It dipped, but it only dipped to the depth of the recession a couple of percentage points, um, and it didn't recover past that point until 2015. 
Um, so um, while some people look at these numbers in the out years and think these are harsh and why aren't we gonna be back or above um, the pre-existing conditions, um, depending on the magnitude of the economic consequences uh, that persist, um, it's entirely possible that um, between the communication substitution and economic consequences, uh, the VMT simply won't bounce back to 2019 uh, for a number of years till we in fact kind of outgrow the, uh, the adjustment that's taking place right now. Um, the airline side is similarly difficult to predict, as are all of the others. Um, again, there's supply factors as well as demand factors. Uh, the ability and willingness of both the public sector and the private sector uh, to provide services um, at levels of um, that, that might be as attractive as was the case in 2019 uh, remains to be seen. Um, so there could be some um, modest uh, or slower growth in demand simply because the supply isn't there. Um, it's a demand supply game for some of these privately operated uh, modes. And for the publicly subsidized ones, there certainly may be some uh, considerations there as well uh, as we see how um, things mature over time and the willingness and ability uh, of, of government and the private sector to invest in those services um, in, in the, perhaps in the absence of uh, restored demand. Another factor that of course is influencing things is the shift to e-commerce. Uh, this is uh, a simple census data on retail trade, um, shows a big bump. This is in dollars of expenditure. Um, other folks have measures based on um, volume of goods, et cetera, um, and different uh, measurement schemes in terms of what level or what types of commodities they include uh, in their e-commerce definition. Um, but nonetheless, any way you cut it, this is a substantial increase. Um, the, the folks in those industries talk about um, this pandemic, you know, having an impact of anywhere from three to about 10 years uh, of the prior trend uh, and accelerating that trend uh, of e-commerce. Uh, this is the one that's perhaps the most significant for um, surface transportation and, and the kinds of forecasting that um, are urban centric that um, both transit and roadway folks um, concentrate the vast majority of their time on. Um, this is the influence of working at home. Um, the blue bars are from the Census Pulse Survey, September 2 through September 14th. Um, and that was a survey of people that previously were commuting to a place of work. Um, and it asked what share were um, uh, now working at home. And you can see some huge numbers and also a very distinct relationship um, between the share um, and the income levels. Um, the orange bars are the old American community survey um, data. That's not quite the same measure because that not only includes people that have a place of work, um, but are working at home during the survey week, um, but it also includes home-based businesses and stuff, um, which is, is probably half of that. So the, uh, the blue bars underrepresent the total share of the population working at home. Um, those are only people that have shifted uh, from previously having a non-home place of work. Um, but again, a pronounced trend. Um, the big mystery to folks is the extent to which that will persist uh, post-COVID. Um, this is some uh, uh, graph of some of the measures that this happened to be developed by the uh, University of Maryland Cat Lab. Um, this is the share of folks uh, not staying home on a given day, uh, percents of the population. About five to seven percent more of the people are staying home on a given day um, than was the case the prior year. Um, frankly, a little bit surprising. I would have expected a, a bigger bump in it than that, um, but that's the, the data that's cell phone based that uh, uh, folks are talking about. Um, there's a lot of survey work that's taken place looking at telework. Um, a really a couple of points here um, to make. Um, folks really appreciate the time and money they're saving by working at home. Um, and, and that shows up in both anecdotal data and survey data. Um, and there's a mixed bag, but generally um, folks anticipate uh, and look forward to um, at least working at home uh, a number of days a week, perhaps not full-time, but certainly a number of days a week. Um, and 
There are folks looking at the employer side of this equation too. Um, but remember, we'll have had about a year's worth of this environment um, and, and perhaps a little bit more. Um, and then we'll have to see late spring uh, and next summer uh, what share of folks are, are willing to revert to um, prior uh, conditions as it relates to, to working. This graph is, is one that um, really kind of paints the picture of the magnitude of potential change we're seeing. Um, these are commuting mode shares uh, for work trips since the beginning of the American Community Survey in 2005 uh, up to present. The dotted lines are, are, are guesstimates of what would happen or what is happening um, going forward. Uh, the 2020 numbers uh, are, are going to be pretty close simply because we're we're most the way through this calendar year, uh, and we have a pretty good sense of what the work at home numbers are going to look like uh, for that 12 month period. Um, so we're likely to see a 20 plus, 25 plus percent uh, number for work at home for this year. Um, what we're a little bit less clear on is where did that come from? how much came from which other modes. Um, and, and that we'll have to wait and see what the data says. Um, but really the big uh, uncertainty in terms of the most significant influence on uh, travel behavior will be what will be the 2022, 2023, uh, et cetera, work at home number. Um, if we think of that in full-time equivalents, what's that number gonna look like? Um, is it gonna be double digit percentages? Um, recognizing that in 2019, we had 5.7% of folks um, usually working at home. Um, folks are speculating that that will increase a little to increase a lot um, with a little meaning uh, might be as modest as a doubling. Um, which in our realm of the typical pace of change in transportation is huge um, to other folks thinking it might be um, a mid-teens or higher number. Um, I've pasted a 16% in there. Uh, if I had to place money on that bet, depending on the spread, I might notch it down a percent or two. Um, but the reality is it's likely to be meaningfully different um, than an unprecedented pace of change um, than what we've historically seen. Um, and that has huge ramifications uh, to transportation planning. Um, this is uh, information on the change in the hourly, uh, hour of day temporal distribution of travel demand. Um, this is data from INREX that was processed by the Department of Energy based on the INREX volume trend data. Um, that they've developed. And you can see uh, the morning peak is dramatically diminished. Uh, the afternoon peak is lower um, and spread out a little bit. Um, and some of this work's been extended for later months. Um, that afternoon peak is moving up, um, but the morning peak is still considerably uh, diminished relative to historically. Um, that's something that, that folks will want to be watching going forward uh, to understand the implications of the temporal distribution of travel. Obviously, that influences congestion, uh, travel time, average speed, et cetera, uh, which is going to spill into um, travel behavior decisions, mode choice decisions, et cetera. Another element that we're observing in the data um, relates to a geographic redistribution of VMT. While we're back to within 10% of historic person VMT levels, um, we're not within 10% in our urban areas. Um, interestingly, there's a distinct um, difference here um, between urban and non-urban areas. And we're seeing that show up in the data. Um, the orange line in this graphic is the recovery numbers, the, the index numbers for 98 metropolitan areas that INREX tracks. The blue number is the national total average inclusive of urban and non-urban areas. Uh, they're about 5% apart. Um, so if we had a non-urban U.S. and an urban U.S., the spread would be even greater. Um, what that means is um, the urban oftentimes commuting related, um, but not strictly commuting related, urban travel is, is 
meaningfully uh, diminished. Um, Non-urban travel is, is much less diminished. In fact, there's parts of the country uh, and parts of areas that are seeing, uh, in effect, normal travel. Um, and that, again, that's something that's going to be critical to understand for our planning, uh, knowing where the congestion is, how it's going to influence uh, trip uh, trip making and trip planning and investment decisions uh, going forward. The next few slides talk about uh, some of the residential land use side. Um, historically, we've continued to be migrating to the south and the west, um, more recently more so to the south than the west, um, and we're seeing uh, declining overall growth in the population in the country country. We're now well under 1% per year. Um, and interestingly, about the middle of this decade, we shifted from relatively strong urban growth um, to a recovery of uh, suburban growth trends and a softening of urban growth trends on the right side graphic here um, that, that's apparent in that um, particular graph. Five minutes, Steve. Yep. Um, okay, we're going to have to fly here. Um, this is uh, rental trends for the same uh, for some different cities in the country, a distinct change in uh, land use as it relates to residential emerging. Um, that's backed up uh, the same thing on the housing uh, side with some record growth in, uh, in home sales, unprecedented uh, historically. Um, and having looked at all that, the message is while it's exciting and dynamic, um, the reality is the infrastructure base for residential is so rigid and so fixed um, and the incremental changes are relatively modest in total. Um, we're adding infrastructure at about one, one and a half percent per year. Um, so you simply can't uh, redistribute very rapidly. Um, the commercial side is, is a little bit more interesting. Uh, we haven't seen the full impact of that yet. The cycles of change there uh, are a little bit slower. Um, but we're likely to see some things happen and the ability to potentially do some uh, adaptive use of structures um, could accelerate some of those trends. We could see some redistribution uh, of work and retail and some other activities uh, there. Uh, for those doing long range planning, um, I'll refer you to the language on the, on the left in this slide. Um, there's a legitimate issue associated with does the ability to have ubiquitous communications diminish the historic influence of agglomeration uh, on activity patterns? And what's that gonna mean uh, for cities going forward? Uh, the language on the right is some very eloquent academic style language from David Levinson, uh, but very insightful and challenging. Uh, in terms of implications. Um, this is the cumulative set of factors that influence VMT. Um, a number of negative factors, um, partly based on uh, residual economic impacts, um, but as we've got several things to look at, I'll click through them. Uh, this is some work for Airlines for America that looked at uh, the airline side, again, using scenarios to look at trends. Um, the big risk for the airline side is foregone business travel. Um, that's what they're most nervous about um, because that's a significant share of their profitability. Um, and we're also seeing currently some mode shifts to driving, particularly for shorter uh, trips. Um, and that's a significant factor that we need to pay attention to. Um, discount airlines have really been absorbing a lot of the long distance travel. Um, some of that shifted back, obviously. Um, and, and for folks doing forecasting, we'll need to uh, think more about that interplay between uh, air and roadway travel, at least for longer trips. Uh, this is the transit side of things, a huge challenge for the industry. Um, the trends are, are, are pretty harsh, as you can see in this graph. The September and October numbers uh, were similar. Um, I'm going to clip through this uh, quickly here, but I'd encourage folks to take a look at this. This shows the geographic uh, changes for the top 26 markets in the country, uh, as well as the averages. Um, and this slide here is kind of uh, a, a powerful image on the upper right hand side. You can see 
um, a key finding here. Um, urban rail is down 72%, why bus was down 37%. Um, stark differences, differential impact across public transit modes. Um, and if you look at the work at home to income distribution that we talked about earlier, and then you couple it with uh, the mode choice uh, uh, considerations as a function of income on the left hand side of this graph. Um, basically, you're seeing uh, white collar information workers from suburbs to central business districts, um, folks that are very uh, able to shift to telecommuting um, and or shift to an alternative mode. Uh, they're not resource constrained or captive. Um, they've abandoned rail services um, and created that that uh, huge disparity and impact on public transportation. Um, here's the public transit challenge. Uh, again, economic implications, supply side implications, uh, continued and potentially some residual fear of group travel, um, et cetera. Um, this is a portrait to talk about the various effects and their influence across sub modes. And then I'll get to what this means for planning in these next few slides here, uh, if Ram will lend me a few minutes of time here. Um, I proposing or suggest that we um, really rethink virtually every aspect of planning in the context of what have we learned going through this uh, COVID situation. And while COVID creates the opportunity, um, some of what we're seeing, um, the substitution of communication, the, the impact of technology on travel choices and business models, um, the emergence of automation, uh, et cetera, those are other trends that similarly and coupled with COVID um, really give us pause and, and in, at least in my opinion, um, th I think it's time for a serious reflection on uh, how we carry out about planning. Um, here's the questions that um, uh, that I hope the folks uh, listening to this are are going to be busying themselves with over the next months and years because I think these are some of the challenges the industry faces. Um, we've obviously got macro issues like how do we integrate equity, resilience, and adaptability into our planning uh, more proactively. Um, I don't think scenario planning is sufficient. Um, that seems to be our default answer to uncertainty is, well, we'll do scenarios. Um, I think we need to go beyond that. I think we need to find measures of flexibility and adaptability of assets. We need to think about the timing um, and, and other characteristics of investment decisions uh, that play into it. Um, I think we have a real challenge in that we, we need to learn how to plan for declining demand in some markets and some modes. And um, right now about a, somewhere between a third and a half of the counties in the country are shrinking. Um, and we're seeing a number of urban areas as well um, shrink in some core urban areas. Um, and as a planning profession, uh, we inevitably are planning for growth. Um, and I think we need to be a little more uh, realistic in, in certain markets and understand that we need to find ways to do a good job of planning uh, for decline, um, at least in, in terms of the demand side. Um, we're going to need to look at all our performance metrics post COVID. A classic example of that is, uh, um, you know, buses operating with half their old load don't have the same uh, performance metrics, cost, uh, energy use per passenger mile, emissions per passenger mile, et cetera. Um, and when we're thinking of environmental impact assessments and other things, we need to be able to adjust uh, to the post COVID conditions uh, and integrate those into our planning. Um, the challenge on the modeling side will be integrating communications and characterizing post-COVID travel behavior. Um, we'll need to decide what data we need to monitor things. Um, and we'll need to have some sense of when conditions are stable enough um, that they're appropriate for discerning uh, behaviors that we can use for forecasting into the future. Um, none, none of those are easy tasks. Uh, uh, it'll, it'll take folks like uh, a lot of you in the on, on the line to figure out how best to do that. Um, and I think um, there'll be some fascinating things on the, on the 
demographic and database side as well. Um, which trips are going to be lost to telecommuting? Um, are we going to have, well, if, let's say telecommuting jumps to 10 or 15 percent. Um, does that mean the CBD is, is 20 or 30 percent telecommuting because those are the jobs most conducive to it? Um, and what does that mean in terms of travel demand and trip distribution patterns? Um, we could have the same thing on the home ends of trip with some more dispersion um, and changes in, in travel activity. We can see a temporal redistribution of demand that can influence peak conditions uh, and congestion levels. Uh, another challenge will be um, this temporal distribution over days of the week. Um, are we going to have uh, congested urban roadways on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday? Um, and are we going to um, rethink how we plan and model? And are we going to build infrastructure for three day a week peaks um, and spec transit service for three day a week peaks? Are we going to use travel demand management and other strategies to try and smooth that? Um, and uh, uh, a host of these kinds of, of challenges. Um, also the, the time and money saved by substituting communication for travel, some of that might be redeployed on other travel, including social recreation travel. Um, and I think it'll be a uh, take us some time uh, to sort through and develop measures of that. There's old work on that, but it's perhaps not relevant. Um, and finally, this last slide, I was thinking about just how profound some of the behavioral changes that we're seeing um, might be permanently, and particularly um, this work plays a huge role in people's lives. And if we truly think about working at home uh, as a more permanent uh, condition going forward. What does that mean? And, and then I, I decided to dig around and get a sense of how important work is. And um, some of the data said, you know, 22% of people met their uh, spouse or partner at work. Um, but interestingly, 37% met online. So in some ways, those social relationships uh, were moving out of the place of work quite a while ago. Um, and interestingly, online marriages have been happier and more stable, according to the data. Um, but but also interesting, 85% of affairs began at the workplace. So um, the, the, the point of, of identifying that is, is not that that in itself is relevant, um, but there may be consequences of these changes um, that might arise that we haven't really yet considered. Um, we might substitute uh, other activities to replace that socialization that we used to get from work. Um, there may be more civic activities, more social activities. Uh, we may not go to work to work with colleagues, but we may meet the colleagues for lunch or, or, or drinks after work um, to, to, to replace that socialization element, et cetera. Um, and so the behavioral folks and the travel activity folks will have to sort through that uh, and figure out what's going to happen going forward. Thank you for the extra few minutes, Ram. I'm done. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, always an interesting ending in your presentations, for sure. So uh, we will move on quickly to our next speaker, who is uh, Gabe Yu. He's a senior modeler with AECOM. His co-author is Michael Hyland uh, from UC Irvine. Uh, so Gabe, if you will share your screen and presentation. Um, and Gabe is going to talk about an interesting uh, dynamic behavioral model for uh, ordering uh, mobility on demand services. Gabe, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Uh, How's my, uh, how's my screen? Very good, very good. Thank you. That's great. Okay. So uh, this, uh, thank you for the opportunity and this uh, research on a dynamic behavioral model for uh, capturing uh, preference and response time comes from a collaborative effort between Professor Michael Hyland at UC Irvine and me myself at uh, AECOM. And we find that uh, ordering mobility on demand service provides a very good application and model development context for understanding the behavioral dynamics during a decision and uh, or a sequence of decisions. It may, um, it may help improve uh, prediction and it may help uh, understand uh, user heterogeneity uh, and estimate the impact of various operational strategies and policies on uh, individuals and the systems. A closely associated paper was recently published on Translation Research Part C, in which we uh, named the model Generalized Diffusion Model. 
to uh, set the context, uh, the graph shows a conceptual framework uh, from left to right is the general time direction. And we have operator on the upper side and a user on the lower side. Uh, initially, the user would open an app application, uh, type in the destination and send the initial query. The user then uh, would have to wait until the initial call estimate is received. Uh, then the user would either click confirm or reject. If the user confirms, uh, the operator starts to actually allocating a service vehicle and sends the updated cost estimate. During the matching process, the user uh, might lose patience and uh, close the app or wait until the updated cost is received and waiting for the car to arrive. During the waiting, the user can either uh, reject or cancel with and without a late pen uh, penalty uh, imposed by the uh, operator. And we noticed that there are at least two step decisions involved uh, to complete this uh, quote unquote single decision of ordering a mobility on demand service. And we also noticed that uh, because the information update, the perceived utility of the updated cost estimate may well be influenced by at least the uh, initial estimate. Uh, for each sub decision, the user needs time to respond. Uh, this includes the sensory detection time, the deliberation time, and the time that user needs to click confirm using their uh, either their finger or if, if they're holding a copy or something, they may or knows. Um, and users might also uh, face pressure from from the operator, say uh, a countdown for a cancellation fee or due to their own circumstances, uh, which uh, will uh, influence their final decision as well as the response time. So in summary, the four factors, sub-decisions, information update, response time, and time pressure are endogenous and can be quite messy to consider. For example, information update influences preference and response time, while longer response time leads to higher likelihood of information update by the operator. Uh, time pressure influences response time and sub decisions, while information influences perceived time pressure and the following decisions. So we find that a generalized uh, diffusion model provides a good framework to explicitly capture the quote unquote spaghetti of this, all these factors in a quite a tractable manner and allows uh, axiomatic analysis that is often considered quite important uh, in behavioral dynamic economics, uh, mathematical psychology, and, and decision science. The original diffusion model was initiated in the uh, 1970s, and later it was uh, applied to human decisions. And one of the most used uh, version is called uh, decision view theory, or DFT. Uh, in the model, we have preference state um, that is uh, uh, that update itself in each time step based on its previous state, as well as the certain uh, feedback parameter to capture things like a decaying working memory. The valence uh, V uh, refers to the contrast of two stimuli or in binary decisions that the difference of the two utilities uh, plus a uh, deterministic part at plus a random utility, uh, random term. Uh, we can visualize this graph where uh, from, from left to right is the time direction and the state preference starts from an initial preference state which captures the bias caused by the uh, prior decisions and prior information, then it progresses uh, uh, stochastically. When it reaches the upper bound, option one is chosen. And when it reaches the lower bound, the option two is chosen. We can set different inhibitor thresholds to uh, capture time pressure. Another way to set a ver uh, is, is to set a vertical bar. And uh, which way to use depends really on the uh, specific type of time pressure. To capture information framing and decision under risk in, in the valence V, uh, we use the prospect theory with uh, multiple compensatory attributes. Uh, the representing function V tilde is uh, formed additively by the value function of the scaled uh, attributes. Uh, where not only the uh, utility difference matters, but also whether or not the utility is positive or negative relative to the uh, reference point or status quo. Uh, 
Uh, next, I just want to put a few more words on how we use prospect, favor, uh, prospect theory to capture information assays. The graph here uh, shows the value function, which is one of the contributions that leads to the prospect theory to win over price. It uh, represents the psychological value of gains through the uh, uh, right half and the losses through the uh, left half. Uh, note that the, the two pieces of curves are, uh, uh, even though continuous, but not, not symmetrical to the uh, reference point where the uh, convexity uh, reverses uh, and then the response to losses looms larger than the response to, uh, to the corresponding gains. This is often referred to as a loss aversion. If the operator says that the, uh, as an example, if the operator says the waiting time is 10 minutes, uh, and if the user's reference point is uh, zero, then we can get the value of those in 10 minutes. And similarly, if the operator says that the waiting time is 70 minutes, uh, we can get the value of losing 70 minutes. But if the waiting time is updated from 70 minutes to 10 minutes without considering the information update, this is supposed to be the, uh, gaining some, the value of gaining seven minutes. But because the reference point now has changed, so this now is the, uh, the new value. So, so if we put them together, both situations and in 10 minutes waiting time, but because the path, the code of the code unquote pass is different, uh, the user feels them very differently. And similarly, if the initial waiting time is eight minutes, um, this is the value. And now if it's updated to 10 minutes uh, for the user, that's additional two more minutes lost. So even though both situations end in two, 10 minutes waiting, uh, the user perceives them very differently. Uh, but of course, this is only for uh, decision under certainty and we, waiting functions are, uh, are for gains and loss are needed uh, for decision under uh, risk and uncertainty. So Mike, Mike and I uh, apply the combined models to a case study. Uh, we chose shared use AV mobility service or SAMS uh, as an application context. Uh, and one main reason that we chose SAMS is because currently human drivers in the mobility on demand service market can also reject and cancel. So in order to remove that type of uncertainty and simplify the case study, we use SAMS so that it's relatively safe to assume that the operator has the full control of their service fleet. The parameters of the baseline scenario was in, uh, initiated from some classic value in their corresponding component theories, which have been shown to be quite generalizable to, um, to different uh, application fields. The only two uh, degree of freedom is the inhibitor threshold, theta, uh, but we, we, we didn't really have much room to adjust that either since it influences both uh, preference and response time quite significantly and simultaneously. So in a sense, this model is more uh, falsifiable than regular discrete choice model because the proposed model needs uh, to not only capture the preference, but also the response time distribution for each, uh, each alternative. And each parameter influences both preference and response time distribution simultaneously. So we can pull a few more simulation uh, instances to illustrate this process. So initially, uh, the user will uh, type in the, their destination and send the query to the operator. And then they'll wait until the initial cost estimate is received from the operator. And then, and then hopefully they will click confirm. Uh, and then they will have to wait uh, for the operator to send the update. And once they will gradually during the time lose patience. Uh, and then once they receive the update cost, uh, they can either click confirm uh, or uh, they can cancel or re reject. But in addition to, uh, to various sensitivity tasks, we, can, we find that the trade-off analysis is particularly interesting uh, and could have uh, a strong operation and uh, uh, policy implications. In our case study, uh, the operator can uh, enter report uh, initial cost to maximize the first confirmation rate, uh, or uh, at least in the short term. Um, and then the operator can also uh, use information framing to maximize the second confirmation rate 
but that needs operator to uh, to overstate the initial estimate a little bit so that the the updated cost sounds a little bit lower or better. Uh, given that the operator is at least honest about the, the second uh, cost, uh, the updated cost estimate. Uh, uh, therefore, there, there's a trade-off really uh, between the two strategies and in terms of maximizing the overall confirmation rate. So we can also uh, adjust the initial seat preference among other uh, uh, parameters and inputs uh, information to do more comprehensive exploration. A similar trade-off analysis can be applied to various users who have different sensitivities to information framing. And, and we find that this uh, has a various implications on, on the operator size in terms of the pricing algorithms, as well as the local public agencies in terms of their uh, pricing regulations and policy decision-making. It turns out that the uh, four endogenous factors are common challenges to describe and predict many uh, dynamic decisions. So the model could be potentially applied to uh, many other cloud decision contexts. So take the uh, ordering flight tickets as an example for a, a round trip. Uh, the, the returning flight decision typically depends on the departing flight decision. Uh, and the, the, uh, the perceived price is usually anchored by how the price is sorted by the website and presented by the website. And the uh, final price is usually slightly higher than the initially proposed one with the uh, additional either optional or non-optional add-on charges during the ticket uh, ordering process. Uh, because if the ticket agents or, uh, or the uh, airlines are honest and mention those extra charges initially, customers may, may well uh, choose very differently. Uh, this is actually a, a good evidence that the framing effect is, is robust or else the, the business won't, won't do it. And there's no, no need to do the extra effort. Um, and customers also take time to decide. When facing multiple similar alternatives, it usually takes longer. Uh, and because it takes longer, usually the uh, website usually puts a, a countdown for holding the tickets, uh, which may, may add some pressure to the to the customers. Okay, take the travel decisions in COVID. Yeah. Gave okay. about four, four uh, minutes. Thanks. Okay, got it. Thanks. Uh, and take the travel decisions in COVID as another example. Uh, people face uh, ongoing decisions about whether to travel, which is influenced by what decision they made previously in a similar uh, trip purpose uh, or decision context, and whether they have developed uh, symptoms which usually have a two to 14 days of the information delay. Uh, at the beginning, when the media report that there's a two cases, say two cases in, in their neighborhood, people might uh, freak out. But later when uh, the cases reduces, reduces from say 200,000 to 100,000 people, um, might, might feel the situation got a lot better and, and the local restaurants and bars should reopen and they finally can get, a, can get together again. Uh, and people might also have different deliberation times to make a decision. Uh, also know that the information they have or as well as the policymakers use tends to be lagged behind or even outdated. This is because we don't know the count of a day or a week until that day or a week ends. So their decisions are always based on the past or even outdated information. This is no one's fault. It's just the, an intrinsic property of any complex dynamical system where the observation observations tend to always lag behind the actual state of the system. People might also face various levels of uh, time pressure. Maybe their groceries, uh, groceries running out and maybe some uh, people have to go to the hospital regularly for things like a dialysis and some might have to go to the office to pick up some important documents or uh, reboot the workstation. The latter is probably more common for, uh, for, for translation modelers. So uh, for more details, please check out our paper. Uh, and uh, you can always contact us through the emails below. And we sincerely hope that this paper and this presentation can contribute to modelers and analysts modeling arsenal for modeling on demand services and other travel behavior dynamics. And thank you very much. Thank you, Gabe. Very interesting. Appreciate, uh, appreciate the presentation.
we will uh, move on to our next presenter, who is uh, Mark Bradley with RSG. And Mark is going to talk about some uh, age cohort related differences. Uh, so in travel behavior that uh, that could find a place in travel demand models. So Mark Bradley. Okay, thank you, Ram. I hope you can all see my screen. Um, <clears throat> so now this is something completely different than the previous one. Uh, it's partly a presentation uh, that on work that was done before the COVID um, pandemic, but I'm gonna sort of condense that part of things and also talk about uh, some results from a, a survey done during the pandemic. So the problem, oops, sorry, the problem that I was, uh, that I've originally been studying is that most travel demand models assume that in the future, if you put a person in a given uh, the same context, the behavior will be the same in the future. So the model coefficients don't change over time. So, and because we don't have generational or age cohort effects in most models, that means if you plopped me down in the future 30 years from now, uh, where everything was the same as now, I would behave the same as my parents' generation are behaving now. Or if you took my children and put them in that future 30 years from now, but with everything else the same, they would behave the same as my generation is behaving now. But in reality, there, there's differences between the generations. A lot of it's subjective, the stuff that's usually in data, like age, of course, uh, what type, who's in your household, uh, employment status, income, but and lots of other things. There's also subjective differences between the generations, like a lifetime of travel experiences and the habits that have been developed over time, attitudes about health and exercise, attitudes about the environment and uh, carbon footprint, that sort of thing, attitudes towards using new technologies and being able to use those technologies, and uh, participation in the shared economy. And I'm sure we could think of a whole list of other ones. But when the generation, so when my generation reaches uh, the age of my parents' generation or 30 years into the future, how will they be different from how my parents' generation was or is now? And um, so the age difference, of course, will disappear. The things like uh, ha whether you have kids in the household, whether you're retired, what, whether you're on social security, those things will be more of the same. So those differences, objective distance differences sort of disappear. But these other things about habits, attitudes, um, just historical effects, those tend to persist over time as, as sort of a, the, sort of a collective psychology or you might say, or a sociologist might say of the, uh, of the generation. And that affects travel behavior. So this is a, a population pyramid. Those are women on the left in red, men in the, on the right in blue. And the, the generations going up uh, as age goes up there. There's been a lot of interest in millennials because it's kind of that fatter part there uh, around age between 20 and 40. Um, also called the the echo of the baby boom, which is the other bigger, genera fatter generation up there. Uh, a lot of interest because young adulthood is uh, a period when people are first going out on their own, living on their own, can form new habits and attitudes. And these particular people came of age sort of during a major recession and when climate change was starting to become evident. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna talk too much about this. There's a lot of people in this um, audience have probably done research on this. I'm just gonna mention a couple things. You need longitudinal data over a long period of time to sort out the age effects from the age cohort or generation effects. 
and other key variables. So this was analysis by Noreen McDonald, uh, used three waves of NHTS and found that millennials, when you controlled for everything else, were using um, the auto less for less mileage than other uh, age cohorts. And as part of a NCHRP study, some colleagues and I sort of replicated those results and tried to, to sort of break them by, by changing the model of forms and variables and, and really kept the same conclusions, but I don't have time to go into that much. So nice thing about population pyramids is you can make them move like this. And uh, you'll see the big thing as we go to 2050 is that that top part up there just keeps getting fatter, more people getting old or in the older generation. Everybody's getting old, but more people survive to longer uh, lifetimes. So I'm already trying to forget 2020, so I'm gonna show 2019 here compared to 2049. And the biggest difference you'll see is just that this upper level over age 70 is a lot more people there in 30 years from now than there are now. So it's also important to study seniors, what we call seniors travel. Uh, not only is it a growing part of the population, but retirement can also be a, a transitional period uh, when you can form new habits, maybe move to a different place. Um, I'm interested in studying it because uh, uh, I'm over 60, so I will soon be one of them. And they say retirement ages are getting longer and I can sort of attest, I have no idea when I will want to or be able to retire. So uh, you can see that those things are, are happening over time. And it's a question whether the pandemic will go reinforce that or maybe go in the opposite direction. So we've done one uh, analysis looking at all the different age cohorts. This was part of an update of an IMPACTS 2050 model that was part of this NCHRP project. Um, it's a strategic model that can look at age cohorts evolving over time. And, and so in a recent update to 2060, uh, we did an NHTS analysis from four waves using the latest 2017 wave. And for different travel choices and controlling for all these other variables, including period specific effects. So I'm only gonna show one um, result from this, which is the results from a non-work trip mode choice model. And these are just uh, utility coefficients. And it's interesting if you, if you look at age groups, so how old, was the person at the time of the NHTS survey, four different surveys, you see that as people get older with, with this 45 to 54 as the base, they tend to walk less and bike less, especially bike. But on top of that, if you look at the differences across the age cohorts or the generations, you'll see that each generation walks and bikes more than the previous generation did at this at the same age. And again, that's stronger for biking than it is for uh, walking, but it's pretty significant for both. So that's just kind of an interesting thing that, um, wait a minute, okay. That we can, we can put into our models. Uh, there's no reason why you can't use both age and age cohort variables in your model. If you have a synthetic population, you can figure out which age cohort people are in. One thing you need to do is assume how the next generation or future generations will behave 30 years out because we don't have any data on those yet. So this type of thing is well suited for strategic models. And in general, you know, it's hard to predict how future behavior is gonna change, which is uh, one reason we don't do it. But in this case, we already have some evidence of the differences between generations. So I think it would be good to get in there. 
Okay, the second part of my presentation is going to go uh, into have the age cohorts been affected differently by the pandemic? So we've done a national survey. Uh, we're currently in the field with the fifth wave. The first was done in mid-May when a lot of places were still in lockdown. Second and sort of mid to early July, after July 4th, but before the sort of second little wave of the pandemic came up because of July 4th. Uh, third was in early September when, when rates were relatively low. Fourth in late October before the election, but when rates were starting to go up in a lot of places. And I'm going to present results from those four. We have one currently uh, in the field, which I can present at TRB, but the expecting that now that more places are having sort of lockdowns that the results might look different in mid-December. So there were 3,000 adults in each wave. Uh, we weighted it to within five regions. Targets, we used race, race and ethnicity crossed by income group because um, from different um, sort of uh, equity analyses, we found that you really need to look at those two things in combination. Uh, also cross gender by household composition and age group is was another um, thing which is which was controlled for and which we are uh, is going to be the focus here. This shows the five regions we use for weighting. And also that even before the weighting, the sample was pretty representative of the US population as a whole, but the weighting takes care of further things. So I'm gonna show a few results here. Um, so this is a percent of adults who were employed before March, was, that was based on a retrospective question, and then whether they were employed at the time of the survey in these four waves. So, you see even, uh, of course, the age 65 and up, fewest people employed, also age 20, 18 to 24, a lot of those people in college. Um, employment went down and it's been recovering a little bit overall, but not in the uh, highest age group. So that, and this is sort of the same graph, but as a percent relative to before March. So how much, what's the employment level now compared to before the pandemic? And you can see it's gone down most for the young adults initially, but uh, has recovered some, it's been recovering in most of these, uh, except for the older groups. So that might be some sign of kind of early retirement or taking a pause from, uh, pause from employment in the upper age groups. Uh, people teleworking, the youngest age group under 25 has the least teleworking. For the middle age groups ha have the most and it's been increasing. For the older age groups, also a little bit less and also been increasing a, a little bit. Well, not really, it's been uh, about staying about the same. If we look at that by region of the country, we have the most teleworking, for most of the age groups, the most teleworking sort of in the coastal, Northeast and Pacific regions, the least in the middle parts of the country. Uh, except for the youngest age group where that seems to be pretty stable across the different regions. So now let's look at percent of adults changing their residence um, since before the pandemic. You would expect these to just go up over time. There's a little bit of random variation, so, but, but generally they go up. And youngest younger people are far more likely to move and that gets lower as people get older. Uh, I think that's true in general, but uh, also during the pandemic. What's really interesting, we have the zip code of each person and we put those into quintiles based on population density. So it's interesting to see, are people moving to a less dense or a more dense area? For the youngest age group, that's where you see the most change. A lot of people moving to less dense areas, we figure that's 
uh, probably a lot of students moving back in with their parents to, to more rural or suburban areas where, but some people also moving maybe to more ur urban areas to find jobs. Uh, and in the oldest age group is where there's the least change, especially not hardly any people moving to more dense areas, some people moving to less dense in the uh, sort of oldest age group. How about college enrollment of the, of the people? So of course, the older you get, the more people never even thought about going to college, enrolling for college this fall. But you see a lot of people have deferred going to college due to COVID. And most places, a lot more people are attending classes just online than in person. And if we look at that by part of the country, we see, the, again, the coastal regions, Pacific and Northeast are where most people have the highest rate of people deferring college and also the lowest rate of late rates of people attending uh, class in person. It's only about 10% in those compared to 30 to 20 to 30% in the other uh, places. So my, my last slides are gonna be about um, differences in using modes uh, across the age groups. This sort of agrees five, with- um, Five minutes, Mark. Okay, great. Uh, this sort of agrees with Steve's uh, thing that car use went down a lot initially during the pandemic and has been sort of coming back and uh, it's pretty similar, it looks pretty similar across the age groups. It'll be interesting to see if it goes down again uh, in the December wave now that more people are have uh, curfews, lockdown orders, things like that. Um, if we look at it for transit, we don't see as much recovery, especially among the older age groups who are more, probably more concerned about the, health effects if they were to be infected. Whereas the younger age groups used, not only did they use transit more to begin with pre-COVID, but are uh, using it more, their, their use has grown back over time. And again, it'll be interesting to see what that looks like in December. This is TNC. Because there's smaller sample size who use TNC, there's a little more randomness here, but See, younger people were more likely to use TNC, and that's been coming back, according to, the, to our survey. Whereas for the older age groups, similar to transit, was lower and hasn't really come back, except for a little blip there for 65 and over. How about bike use? There's sort of anecdotal evidence that bike use has been exploding during COVID. Um, that a lot of people may be buying bikes, especially in the like parents who have young kids in these age groups, but really um, there's a lot less bike use for commuting because um, people are working more from home. So actually bike use overall has been going down, um, even though maybe more people are biking, they aren't biking as often. And finally, uh, going out to exercise. That's been going up sort of gradually, pretty similar for every age group, maybe not as much for the oldest age group. And again, that may be lower in December, we'll, we'll find out. Um, so I'll just wrap up. Um, is there anything I can sort of uh, summarize this? I would say for the younger, youngest adults, sort of the younger millennials, the Gen Y, um, there's been a lot of sort of effects due to delaying college, maybe moving back home. They're the least likely to work group in terms of working from home. But I would say they're the fastest group in some ways in sort of returning towards normal, especially in terms of going out and finding jobs, even if they're jobs that are sort of they're overqualified for. Um, and also um, in terms of mode use. Whereas on the older adults, um, 
a lot of them seem to be staying unemployed. So it may be accelerating retirement, which would be going away from the sort of prevailing trend, I think. But there seem to be the slowest in returning towards normal in terms of uh, mode use, especially. And a lot of that may be due to more health concerns. So it'll be interesting to see if that persists after the pandemic or not. So that's all I have. Thank you. I can Great, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, yeah, nice two part presentation, very interesting findings. Uh, so was, is that a panel panel survey? So it's the same folks? Uh, no, no. Um, we were originally thinking of that, but it's a repeated cross section. Okay, okay. Gotcha. So yeah, it was twelve thousand. Now it's it'll be up to about fifteen thousand. So it's about three thousand different people in each wave. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, it's hard to hard to keep a panel going. Yeah. It's such yeah. <laughs> totally, totally appreciate that. Thank you. And we will move on to Nancy McGuckin, who is going to uh, kind of anchor uh, the the uh, session with a presentation on what's been happening during the pandemic. Oh, hi. Hi, everybody. Let me put my video on. I was worried that people were going to talk about all this stuff before I got here. But um, luckily, I've all got I've got new stuff. So that's good. Lean in. I'm going to go very fast. So we have time for some discussion at the end. I wanted to start. I wanted to start a little further back and look at the trends before the pandemic. So just for some background, some of the important components of travel demand had been pulling in different directions. So population growth and longer trip lengths, they were increasing travel demand um, since 1995, while declines in trips per traveler and declines in total trip rates, meaning more people just staying at home, were kind of decreasing travel demand since 1995. And I wanted to just note that even before the pandemic, when we looked forward, we saw a slowing in travel demand um, because of slower population growth, which uh, Steve Pozine did note. A lot of states are actually looking at absolute population losses. And I think this is gonna translate into slower VMT growth overall, in addition to whatever we lose from the pandemic. And you know, immigration has been a big part of the US population growth over the last decades, which fell about 10% between 2016 and 2018. And we expect those numbers for 2020 to be even lower. So I'm glad that Mark talked about age cohorts because I also saw different groups traveling differently. While everyone in the US is actually traveling a little bit less than they did in 1995, there are real different populations trending in different directions. So for example, people with bachelor's degree traveled about 50% less in 2017 compared to the miles they put in VMT in 1995 where the people with no bachelor's degree traveled about 10% less. People, um, white people and those with higher incomes also traveled less in 2017 compared to non-whites and those with lower incomes when you're comparing them back 25 years ago. So with those long-term trends in mind, I wanted to quickly talk about things that accelerated dur during the pandemic, no surprise to anyone, that they're really it's work at home and telecommute and fewer out of home activities, but there's also been an increase in gig and alternative work um, situations. So let's start with work at home. Um, before the pandemic in the pre times, people who worked at home and people who telecommuted were had some of the same characteristics in common. They were higher income, older, white, most likely male, and before, in the pre-times, people, um, in terms of travel, we had to really separate workers who usually worked at home from telecommuters, who maybe telecommuted two or three days a week because their travel behavior was quite different. Workers who usually worked at home 
before the pandemic traveled almost 20% fewer miles than traditional workers. And it included many semi-retired, older professional, white, higher income men. And so I, with that age impact, I think that really put a drag on their travel. On the other hand, telecommuters traveled almost 30% more miles in the pre-times compared to traditional workers. Um, they're more likely to be a little bit younger, live in exurban areas, have longer trip lengths for other trip purposes. But I wanna make sure that we understand looking forward, the populations of people who are gonna work at home and the people who are gonna telecommute are likely to be completely different demographics than these pre-pandemic groups. And therefore their travel will be different than what was in the past. Um, maybe in June sometime, sometime over this year of 2020, we kind of reached a peak of work at home. Um, this data is from a current Stanford uh, survey. It, I, I wanted to just, again, note that this big chunk of the pie of people not working is important to keep in mind. The way we keep our unemployment statistics means that we are going to lose some of these people when we talk about unemployed over the next six months. So um, I think BLS is gonna help us with that, but it's important to remember that there is still a big chunk of people who are actually not working at all. Um, so, you know, the, this, it's a, the, the effects and the numbers are quite uh, um, interesting when you look at the people who are working at home. This is the highest number I think we've ever tracked. And of course, you know, it's gonna be, <laughs> In, uh, related to demographics, um, many workers, our essential workers, were not able to work at home. These are people with less than a high school diploma. 90% of workers said they were not able to telecommute. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum, the wor workers with a bachelor's degree or higher, only 30% were not able to telecommute during the pandemic. So some of the implications um, are are these, you know, there's a lot of realtor based evidence. And I think Steve Posey went through a lot of that very quickly that people are looking for new homes and the housing market is all a buzz. And there's this talk of Zoom towns, um, but moving to Zoom towns is actually just part of it. Uh, the housing market could be, could really reflect a lot of different things that are going on. And we're gonna have to wait a couple of years to really see what was happening. Uh, what's happening with remote work and residential location. But the declines in commuting could be balanced out by more travel for other reasons, um, which we saw in the pre-pandemic telecommuters. If people who work at home do wanna go meet their colleagues for drinks after, after work or have lunch together, um, these, this could actually outweigh some of the loss in VMT from work at home. Um, but you know, that's just not gonna be the same population. So at this point, we just don't know how they're going to behave. And I just wanted to bring up one thing I did talk about a little bit before uh, we started our things just in our small group, but this idea that people can work in San Francisco and live in Iowa City is uh, true, but it's also that there's a lot that will be a rebalancing of the service sector because of offshoring. And there's before the pandemic, there was already quite a lot of offshoring of service sector jobs, higher income, middle uh, class jobs, especially in IT. And these were the jobs that uh, were considered vulnerable to being offshored before the pandemic. I think, you know, if many of these jobs are moved to lower wage countries, that shift could really disrupt the service sectors as much as the offshoring of manufacturing jobs did during the early 2000s in the US. Um, in 1970, 25% of US jobs were manufacturing, but in 2009, just 10% of jobs in the US were manufacturing. And currently, we talk about a service economy because currently around 80% of US workers are employed in the service sector. Um, if that gets rebalanced, because of offshoring, where it'll be very interesting to see what happens. And I, I did want to talk about the increase in gig work. This is again something that we've seen during the pandemic. 
Uh, the trends were already there showing that many US workers were employed in the gig economy, either part-time or full-time. And although the definitions in this area are a little hard to get right, um, yeah, there are a lot of gig programs, platforms out there. And there's also, you know, Mechanical Turk and other kind of crowdsourcing that people are turning to during the pandemic in order to um, supplement their incomes. Um, so the demand for gig, these apps has increased since the virus does, was declared a national emergency. There's also a lot of money investment and big players in this space. Ikea has purchased TaskRabbit, Postmates was bought by Uber, Amazon uh, got rid of Instacart after it bought Whole Foods. There's just a lot of churn and movement in this market that's worth paying attention to. The reason that it's important to us as transportation planners is that the fragmentation of work and the cobbling together of different gig jobs um, could impact very, very basic measures, such as the percent of workers who are traveling in the peak period. And uh, transit has taken such a hit during the pandemic. Many transit agencies are cutting service to save money. And what are they cutting? They're cutting their weekend and off-peak service. This might coincide with the, <laughs> with the needs of workers who are not traditional workers. So um, maybe these trends during the pandemic are going in different directions. I did a, a, an entire piece of work on this for Ashto that will be released before TRB. Um, and I'll let you know, you know what it is, but there's big in implications to uh, having a lot of workers shift into the gig economy. There's the shrinking portion of workers making traditional commutes during the peak period and fewer opportunities for transit, as we mentioned, more VMT for deliveries and transport and non-peak commuting and more day-to-day -day variation in travel. Some of the previous speakers talked to that about telecommuting. Um, greater portion of workers who are now marginal. Now that was really pre-pandemic. I don't know how that's gonna play out, but certainly fewer workers with benefits means more stress on the state and local safety nets um, going forward. And then I, the last thing I wanted to just talk about were the trends in staying at home. Uh, which is what we've all been doing <laughs> pre-pandemic, as well as during this 2020. So even in the pre-times, um, we should acknowledge that there was already uh, a great trend for uh, people to be more likely to stay at home on an average day. And you can see from 1995, the lighter line at the bottom to 2017, the red line at the top, how though that impact has just been pretty amazing across all the age groups. Um, the trip rates uh, have been declining as other uh, speakers have talked to. Um, across all of the things that we measure, urban, rural, income, age, sex, life cycle, all of it. Um, and the declines predominantly came from trips for shopping and errand, errands uh, in the pre-times. And those trends also included more household delivery. Um, this is all pre-COVID. So these are the trends that we feel have accelerated during the pandemic. So during the pandemic, about 40% of Americans used a food or a grocery delivery app. Um, and again, this was divided into people with higher incomes, um, different ages behave differently. Those with higher incomes, for example, were more than twice as likely to have groceries delivered compared to people with less income. And uh, prognosticators uh, show, assume that in the future, things like food delivery to the home is likely to remain higher than it would have um, had the pandemic not happened. Uh, by 2025, they have an astounding one-fifth of restaurant dollars being devoted to takeout and delivery. So just looking forward, because we like to make graphs and large predictions, that's kind of fun. Um, I do think latent demand might increase travel above the pre-pandemic levels um, for higher income groups, especially for leisure and tourism. And I worry that recessionary effects 
and um, loss of income, uh, loss of jobs might actually decrease travel for lower income groups. Um, I really think that we may be in a situation though where there's this thing called shifting baseline where the shifting baseline of travel may have like permanently shift. So more workers working and playing at home, more home delivery, more home gyms. We've all upgraded our networks and got our gaming chairs and have our, our delivery apps on speed dial. Um, and this may actually have accelerated the trend in people staying at home even more compared to pre-pandemic levels. So uh, my concluding thoughts are that uh, some groups saw larger declines in travel compared to others. And these are the same groups that we see have the ability to stay home, work from home and order delivery during the pandemic. Um, the trends in non-traditional work arrangements, work at home telecommute and increased gig work were also all accelerated during the pandemic. And it's, it's important to keep that in mind because those trends were already quite strong and, and moving in the downward direction and have completely, or moving in the upward direction have completely been accelerated by the pandemic. But these different groups are evolving in different ways. Um, and it's just very, very important to, to remember that when we look forward, we're looking at different population groups for the work at home and telecommute. So it's hard to, to actually predict how they're going to behave. Will they travel less? Will they travel more? I think in short, the past may not predict the future in this unprecedented time. And we're just going to have to be patient and measure those changes as they go along the way. So that's it for me. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Nancy, and uh, thank you for uh, getting us a little bit back more uh, in, on schedule. So really appreciate those uh, insights. Um, so we will now turn over to our discussant. Um, our discussant is Cynthia Chan, who is a professor at the University of Washington. And she'll share her thoughts on the presentations and anything else she has on her mind. So Cynthia. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ron, for inviting me. It's uh, certainly very challenging that um, many good thoughts. And so I would do my job, uh, best job, to try to uh, be a discussant. And Ron give me uh, sort of two tasks. And one is to provide a brief summary of what has been presented by the uh, four awesome speakers. And the second play is to think a little bit about my own thoughts on lessons learned as we move forward, especially commenting on societal resilience post COVID. So my first part is a summary. So um, it's clear that COVID has profoundly changed uh, travel demand. The four presentations told us that uh, we need two lenses, right? And one is from the very top, a very broad view, uh, being mindful about large societal changes. And that include uh, show by several speakers, slower population growth and slower travel demand, even before COVID as uh, uh, just talked by Nancy and offshore and rebalancing of the different industries as we move forward. And they use pattern changes as well as uh, a number of speakers noted uh, the uh, movement, uh, at least right now, we are observing to the less denser areas, as well as the changes that is happening more quickly in the commercial real estate, increasing gig work, and as well as the fact that many of people uh, in the population are actually not able to telecommute. Now, the other lens is, of course, a closer lens that look at the um, differences um, in different geographies for different kinds of trip, and uh, um, also for different kinds of population segments as we anticipate the recovery in travel demand. And that's certainly the part, there's a huge amount of uncertainties. Uh, but um, I just want to note a few interesting things that has been pointed out. And one is that certainly that COVID has accelerated working for home, 
working at home and schooling at home <laughs> and online shopping through the shop increase in uh, e-commerce. And it's actually striking to see, even we have a lot of anecdotal evidence, but it's striking to see the distinctive relationship between those uh, uh, telecommuting and income levels. And that is shown in both Steve and Nancy's presentation. Uh, coming back, we have huge uncertainty um, in terms of uh, um, how they come back across different geographies for different markets. And uh, um, one thing that also has been pointed out for um, in Steve and Nancy um, is, uh, um, and probably Mark's presentation as well is that our transit system is facing huge challenges and during this coming back process. And uh, also, uh, there are differences in geographies. Urban travel is uh, more diminished than non-urban travel. And um, a mark um, uh, show that uh, social demographics still matter as well as I think Nancy shows a little bit of that as well, that there are age effects in different, uh, in the use of transportation and land use related um, decisions. It's actually, very interesting to see that each generation, Mark showed that walk and a bike more than the previous generation at the same age. So um, one thing I also want to point out, I don't remember exactly from whose presentation, but it seems to be that the decreases on bike share seems to be relatively smaller compared to the decreases on other modes and going to exercise actually going up. So that's, uh, very good to see. Um, on the land use side, there uh, we certainly see changes as well, moving to southwest and more to the suburban areas as well. And so um, I want to also make a few comments on the uh, relating to uh, one comment relating to Gabe's presentation on um, really looking at the behavior models and developing behavior models. And uh, Gabe demonstrates that. Um, many uh, things, behavior nuances matter, right? So uh, sequential decision-making, uh, anchoring, information update, response delay, time pressure. And so makes me to think it's time again to rethink our rational choice framework and incorporate, um, develop models to incorporate those behavior nuances. So on the implication, I guess it's uh, um, pretty much a consensus to say that um, um, there are huge implications for us as transportation engineers. And I think COVID has put us, transportation industry and all of us front and center in terms of how we plan, uh, um, how we make, um, uh, how we um, recommend or do our analysis for funding, spending, regulation, decisions, and how we rethink about our roles uh, of the different scales of the government, as well as the relationship between government DOTs and the private sector and what it means for planning. And so um, I just, right now, I'm just summarizing a little bit, I guess from Steve's presentation is, um, it is time for us to re rethink every aspect of the planning process from vision goals, problems, opportunities, data collections, and as well as project level monitoring um, and implementation. And one uh, huge need that is probably in front of all of us is how do we address equity, resilience, and adaptability and incorporate that into the planning. So. I think that's about all I want to say in terms of the first part of the task given to me as the summary um, of the four presentations. And I'm going to move on, just spend a few more minutes on uh, what I think. And so um, I guess repeating myself again that it's um, um, COVID has really put transportation front and center, right? And economy recovery is a top item for country, but economy recovery needs mobility to recover first, and it needs to be recovered safely. So really the big question for many transportation operators in the country, public and private, is how we can adapt systems to meet those additional needs and um, not only to accommodate 
demand recovery and as well as to recover that safely. And so that says a few things that one, that we have, we really need to use technology and align them better with community demands. And we see I, um, several, um, the speakers show that there are markets that are less, um, there are markets that are perhaps show um, more resilient. And one is perhaps the bike and uh, walking modes uh, that um, has, um, uh, anecdotal experience that it has increased, but Mark show that it doesn't increase, but actually it's least decreased. So I want to note that. And so how uh, it's time how we can support those modes and uh, 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 use our technologies to overcome barriers. And the second line of thinking is really how we can coordinate capacity with community demands. And so, um, so that's where that there's even I see there's even more a need for uh, transportation planners, travel behavior uh, modelers to collaborate with our network modelers. And I was just looking at the participant list. I actually see quite a few network modelers and that's uh, uh, very good to see. And the third, of course, right now is um, we have a, uh, um, we have the data and the technologies, right? And to, um, um, to actually allow us to look more into those uh, behavior nuances that I mentioned a little bit earlier. Now, all of these items that Gabe pointed out, sequential anchoring, information update, response delay, and time pressure have been studied in decades old travel behavior theories. But I feel now, we have new opportunities because we have the data and we have the technology to actually be able to observe in real time how um, these things affect people's behavior choices and to do validations. And that is truly needed for the uh, travel behavior field. Um, so I guess that's, uh, oh, that's one last thing I wanna mention is that, you know, for decades I feel our transportation system in uh, probably other non-transportation systems in our society has always been kind of designed given uh, static demand estimates. And that's how we have been designed the system. And so that makes me feel that um, moving forward, we need to think about how to design our systems while acknowledging uncertainties in the demand. And uh, secondly, for our demand forecasting as well, is that perhaps uh, uh, uncertainty quantification should be a um, explicit uh, goal or uh, an important element of the demand forecasting um, as opposed to just looking at the mean accuracy. And I think that concludes my uh, talk. Great, uh, thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Very insightful as always. So uh, much appreciated. I'm going to ask all of our speakers to please turn on their video and uh, come out of hiding so we can get you all together like a panel. So uh, Nancy and Gabe, if you could do the same, that would be great. So uh, thank you. So we have uh, maybe uh, 15 plus minutes or so to uh, just to engage a little bit and talk about uh, what's, uh, what's ahead of us and how our data and models can adapt to these changing times and these accelerated uh, uh, kind of moments of change. Uh, so uh, everybody feel free to post your comments uh, in the chat and we'll try to uh, quickly address them in the time remaining. Um, I will try to get us uh, started off. So Steve, I have a question for you. You were uh, brave enough to make some predictions uh, out through 2024. And it looked like every trend line was depressed uh, or in the negative territory compared to the before or, or the baseline conditions. Um, do you feel like that is due to primarily a shift to work from home uh, or is there some combination where it's uh, you know a work from home 
an increase in e-shopping and, and delivering deliveries. So in other words, my question is, is it merely a shift in VMT from the person slash household to all of these commercial delivery services? And so it's not really a net decrease in VMT. Um, a couple points. I, I think the key factors will be um, the one, the substitution of communications for travel, um, and and not just telework. Telework is, you know, a few percent. Commuting's, you know, under thirty percent of person VMT, about twenty percent of total VMT. So, you know, even if it declined ten percent, it would only be a few percent. Um, but there's we we've really used communications for lots of things, telemedicine, online worship, participating in sports, education, um, errands, personal business. Um, the business community has substituted a lot of um, communication for travel and that's intended to or expected to continue a lot of the uh, sales and meeting type activities um, particularly the meeting and training stuff will, will likely stay online so I do think the communication substitution is a big piece of that I also do predict some residual economic impact I find it hard to imagine that we can have you know a multi-trillion dollar um, hit on the economy um, and while the stimulus may you know dampen or spread that consequence out over time um, and may even result in a in a rebound in 2021 that's surprisingly strong ultimately there's a price to pay and there's going to be you know some of these disruptions and vacancies and bankruptcies and stuff are going to sort out um, and it's going to take some time to recover from that uh, and certainly there's you know to the extent that employment doesn't bounce back to three percent um, we're going to have you know less people commuting and spending etc um, so so i see those two as the two big factors um, regarding the point of the you know the e-commerce substitution um, i think and that's something that a lot of work will will continue to be done to really understand you know each extra um, order results in how much marginal vmt for the delivery van and you know if it's if it's an amazon truck that's you know loading up and delivering 500 items the marginal vmt you know for another stop or another box is pretty small um, if it's somebody ordering a meal um, where there's a round trip from the restaurant for a shuttle uh, vehicle uh, that's real different um, and so you really need to sort through all of the kinds of substitution effects of personal vmt for service generated vmt uh, and sort that out and i'm i'm not expert in that in terms of of knowing how that's going to break out but it's certainly not a one-to-one -one relationship at all interesting thank you steve so nancy let me uh, turn to you and you actually shared a very interesting statistic about the 50 percent drop in vmt per capita yeah isn't that incredible uh, among the educated, I think bachelor's degree or higher, showing wow. a 50% a plus uh, drop in uh, VMT per capita. And I guess my question to you is, where has all that VMT gone? Well, you know, it's funny. I, I took slides out to try to be space efficient, but I did have a slide that showed that the VMT per capita, um, including commercial and residential generated VMT, has remained virtually the same since the 1990, at least, and probably into the 80s, just using FHWA's uh, VM1 table against total US population from the census and dividing it, it has remained the same, which kind of supports your idea that, you know, and I, I think of this a little bit, although it's not true with all ICT, but it's a little bit like the conservation of energy. You know, the VMT isn't going somewhere it's not disappearing it's going somewhere it's balancing out but of course that's not true with digital music and digital books and you know digital digital and of course 3d printing is going to have another huge effect on that digital market so i think that um although there is some substitution there is some just ch changing uh, of, of actual physical manifestations of things that people absorb. So instead of going out to the movie theater, people are gaming. And the gaming is just unbelievable. I mean, 
The American time use survey shows tremendous increases in time, especially in younger age groups, Mark, and young men, especially for gaming. Um, so these are things just to keep in mind going forward. It's not just home deliveries. It's changing the way people spend their time at home. Interesting. Ram, nice. as, a, as, as a quick follow-up to that, the, um, the crossover for air travel, I'd looked at some data, air travel VMTs or PMT has been going up about 5% a year over the past four years uh, with, with auto VMT at less than 1%. But if, if air travel had stayed the same, that would have generated the equivalent of 1% additional VMT. So to the extent that discount airlines are capturing some share of long distance travel um, from roadway, um, that's a fairly meaningful um, potential uh, interaction between those two modes. Um, and, and as Nancy indicated, um, it will be interesting when you think of the kinds of events that have been canceled and remain canceled, the sporting events, the conferences and conventions, the music events and theaters and movies, et cetera, and, and what share of those will return to the same audience size um, you know, the one of the theaters announced they're releasing their uh, first run movies simultaneously online with theater. And, you know, those things will start to or continue to have an impact on travel. Absolutely. Absolutely. They said, yeah. I, I just wanted to quickly say one last thing, and I think you might have heard this about VMT and air, is we're seeing in California anyway, a real resilience to VMT on our roadways. And um, I'm wondering if that's a little bit like after 9-11. After 9-11, we saw increases in VMT nationwide, especially over the holiday period that occurred right after that September event. And everybody was like really shocked, like why would VMT go up in our session? This terrible thing happened. But it was just a little move from air to vehicle travel. It doesn't take very much of those miles to move to buoy up the VMT. And I, I think in some places when we're not seeing declines in VMT, it might be latent recreational or business travel moving to vehicle travel. Vehicle travel. Yep. yep. Makes sense. And yeah, uh, it'll be interesting to see now that, you know, in some states like California, you're not allowed to make long distance recreational trips anymore. Um, be interesting to see if that goes back down. <laughs> Uh, Mark, I'm going to ask you to uh, maybe start us off addressing Guy's comment in the chat. How should MPOs best consider more deeply the changes that COVID-19 will have on transportation systems, recognizing the need to adequately capture post-COVID reality in our models, which are used to inform LRTPs? Well, I mean, we've been... <laughs> you have you have one minute or less. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, just a teaser then. Um, so the uh, you know we've been saying bef before COVID the big topic was autonomous vehicles, which will probably return to being a big topic next year sometime. And the answer to that is we don't know. We have to do scenario analysis. And I think the answer to COVID recovery is we don't know. You have to do scenario analysis. Um, nobody can predict this stuff, right? We can have educated guesses. But, you know, I think it's just a general thing. Our models for way too long have kind of assumed that the future would be like the present, only more so. And now, things like the pandemic and autonomous vehicles and things um, just make it clear that that's, you know, you can't base, you shouldn't be basing planning on that basic assumption. So, so the, that, that, that's my view on it anyway. So the more used to strategic models, which I know uh, Guy's uh, agency are already using to back up the more detailed planning models. So, so um, and anybody can address this, but uh, Mark, just following up. So what, what is your recommendation to an agency? Should they be moving to much more frequent uh, travel survey data collection efforts, uh, maybe almost like a continuous 
uh, travel data collection protocol where you're constantly getting fresh information and being able to monitor trends to update model specifications and so on. Um, well, what are your recommendations to agencies these days? Well, a lot of agencies are doing that. So instead of doing a big travel survey every 10 years, maybe doing uh, smaller ones every two or three years, um, you know, the, they used to coincide with the census, but now the ACS is a lot more important than the census mm -hmm. for, for, for using with survey data. So, um, so we don't have to tie them to the census anymore. And yeah, I think you can use, and that way the surveys perform kind of like double duty for good for modeling, model calibration, also for trend analysis and uh, asking, you know, questions that are important this year, but may not be important in two years from now. Interesting. Uh, any other thoughts? So Gabe, I was just going to ask you, I mean, I, I, I think it was very interesting about how you tried to incorporate a lot of these behavioral facets into the, uh, into the modeling for on the mobility on demand services. So just a couple of thoughts, uh, if you could share uh, what you feel are, is the future of mobility on demand services and especially as we would like to see more sharing. So is your model capable of incorporating aspects of sharing because sharing sometimes has personal preferences associated with, you know, I don't wanna share versus I'm willing to share. Uh, and that also might come with uh, certain time penalties in terms of response time. Right? So if you take a shared ride that maybe uh, makes your waiting time go up, your travel time go up because there's multiple stops, how can your model kind of adapt to a more sharing-based uh, system? Yeah, so it's uh, mainly uh, because uh, we are simplifying the, uh, the case study by assuming that the enter the SAM, so that's only uh, one traveler. Um, but uh, but the uh, the joint decision uh, can also be made. We actually, in the travel demand forecasting, we have been doing this uh, in a sense. Uh, like uh, for example, for travel demand uh, forecasting for trip generation, we use the use the we usually use the uh, households as the unit. Uh, and similarly, we can do this uh, type of uh, study or with definitely a additional extension and uh, and a specification for considering multiple users, they're jointly ordering a mobility on demand service. And, uh, and of course, uh, there's uh, these uh, various other factors uh, that we didn't really consider, uh, uh, but it can be uh, pretty uh, relatively convenient to incorporate. Uh, for example, like when they're ordering a mobility on demand service, maybe some their friends may call them or some other uh, events will happen or traffic condition may change. Uh, so those, uh, that's actually one of the key reasons that's why uh, the information update is important. And in terms of the future, uh, uh, we have a general sense that from the operator side, there was a, a very likely to be a tendency to, because the operator has all those, uh, as Prof Professor Chen mentioned that the, uh, yeah, the, the delay and the response time and all those uh, behavioral nuances uh, those matters, but we sometimes have the trouble of getting the, the model calibrated using the data. Uh, but actually, the operator has all those data. Uh, we, they know the delay, and on the website, they know how, how, how many seconds people need to take the, to, to click confirm. And then also, Uber and Lyft, they have all those data. It's just they don't release them. Uh, so, so I think that's the important potential, uh, not only for capturing those response, but response delay, uh, but also the response delay how many, how many seconds or how many minutes or how many days that people take to, uh, to make a decision actually can inform uh, uh, how people perceive utilities. If uh, the two alternatives are similar in terms of utility, usually people take longer to make a decision. So the response time not only is important by itself, but also it's important in terms of a model collaboration for the traditional discrete choice model. Um, and then for the policy side, on the public, uh, public sector side, I think there's a also a, uh, a potential for uh, incorporating uh, all those behavioral nuances in their uh, pricing regulation. Because I, I don't think right now it's a, uh, at least it's going in a very good direction in terms of this 
uh, the operator potentially trick people by saying the cost is like, you know, 20, 20 minutes and then 20 minutes or 20, $20. And then uh, later on, they update it, say, oh, actually 30 minutes or $30. Uh, so I think there's potential that for uh, local agencies to kind of regulate these kind of behaviors, uh, but not in the sense that, uh, that uh, kind of uh, 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 discourage the model operator to explore how to encourage people to travel or not to travel uh, or uh, using the uh, share, share right. So I think this is a nuanced balance. So uh, I think that's the general two uh, trends that we can see. On one side is the operator has the potential to use more and more such uh, behavioral nuances to kind of uh, adjust or influence people's behavior on the, op on the uh, operator side or the public policy side. Uh, there is a potential for uh, policy or uh, pricing regulations. Um, Good so thoughts. that's my uh, thought. Absolutely, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. And so to bring us home, Cynthia, I am going to ask you to address a, a very important question that has come into chat. So I do want to address it about how, uh, from uh, Kazem Oriani, how equity in transportation can be addressed. Uh, which uh, presumably one could argue has become worse during a time of COVID? Wow, that's a tough question. <laughs> so um, maybe I will do a teaser as well, <laughs> as Mark did. Um, so one of the things it, I see, um, we understand that transit has been hit particularly hard. And um, Although um, if you look at the different population segments, I think it was shown by Steve as well, is that the transit, or maybe not Steve, I forgot. So um, mm -hmm. transit will hit, um, hit um, the, the ridership uh, for transit um, was dropped the most for wealthier mm -hmm. neighborhoods and the less so for mm -hmm. lower income, more ethnic neighborhoods. And so, that is um, uh, one observation. And the other is uh, um, the, if we're looking at weekday versus weekends, the transit ridership was hit most on weekdays because it affected uh, walking trips. And it probably it's more resilient for, uh, maybe a more resilient for off peak travel and weekend ridership as well. So that says to me is that one thing that the transit system can look at um, is that there are certain markets they serve that, are, that seem to be less resilient. And these markets in particular relate to lower income and um, more diverse neighborhoods. So our transit system has been primarily, I think for decades designed for serving work-related trips, which is actually not very friendly for serving other types of trips, other types of non-work trips. So I'm wondering perhaps one thing that could be at least explored into by the transit system is how they can shift the perspective a little bit and look at how they can serve those non-work-related trips better. And that serves both the resilience purpose for um, helping transit system to recover, but also addressing the equity issue potentially. So this is one thought I have. Great, yeah, Tenonga, good thoughts, uh, Cynthia, very much appreciated. Um, let me uh, say that we're just a couple minutes over, so thank you all for joining us uh, and join me in thanking our uh, illustrious speakers uh, for sharing some uh, tremendous uh, data and insights on uh, what uh, the future might hold and, and how things are shaping and, and rapidly evolving. So we have our work cut out for us, folks. So let's get back to work. And with that, uh, thank you everybody. Thank you to the speakers and uh, thank you for joining us. So uh, we are adjourned until next time.